All right. Okay, so you can all see my screen now? Yes, good. <laughs> awesome. Um, yes, yeah, so like I said, I'm the co-director of citizen science at the California Academy of Sciences, and I'm here to talk about taking photos of nature for biodiversity science management and conservation, which is basically um, what we use iNaturalist for um, in our program. So, switch over there. Um, so this is the California Academy of Sciences in San Francisco. Um, hopefully you all had a chance to visit it at some point, um, or when we reopen, hopefully you can come and visit. Uh, we're a natural history museum, so we have a public floor, we have an aquarium, we have a rainforest. But what a lot of people don't know about the Academy is that we also have a very active research division, which I'm a part of um, at the Academy. Uh, and there are curators, um, and basically what scientists do at natural history museums around the world um, is that they uh, document biodiversity. Um, they go places and they try to understand what species occur there, what, what species live there, and then they also try to understand the relationships between those species as well. Um, and so when we were starting our citizen science program, which is all about getting the public involved in doing research um, and, or you know, any part of the scientific process, uh, we really wanted to give people kind of that same experience of natural history museum science or natural history science. You get to discover and be curious and like observe really carefully and document the biodiversity around you. Um, but at the academy, you know, the way that we uh, collect the evidence of the species that are found um, in the places that our scientists work is that they collect specimens um, most of the time. Uh, so we have 46 million specimens at the Academy. We have rows and rows, you know, floors and floors actually of specimens um, there. And th what those specimens are is that they all have, not only are they a physical specimen, but they all come with the information about who found it, where it was found, when it was found. Um, and that kind of makes up a species occurrence record that this species occurred here, um, you know, at, at, at this location, at this time, and this particular person saw it. So when we were starting our citizen science program, we wanted to, you know, like I said, give people that experience of going out and, and looking for and documenting biodiversity, the nature all around them. But we didn't want people to be collecting a bunch of specimens and bringing them to us at the academy. Um, that's not a really sustainable way to run a citizen science program. Uh, so luckily instead, uh, the iNaturalist platform um, at that point was relatively new at the time, but had, was already existing. Um, and so we decided to use that as our main platform for having folks collect data for us. Um, so what iNaturalist is, it's both a, a free app and a website. Um, and what it's designed to do is, for have, is to have people document the species they see around them, uh, to get help with identifications on what those species are, um, which is really nice because you don't have to know what the species is. Uh, you get to share those observations with other people. Uh, and you can also explore and see what other people are finding all around you or anywhere uh, around the world as well. Um, so basically, it's all about turning a photo into a data point. Um, so how does that work? So here's an example um, on the iPhone, the Android looks a little bit different, um, where you go, you know, you try to take a nice clear photo of the thing that you've seen. Um, the app automatically, as long as your location services are on and things like that, the app automatically grabs those GPS points of where you are, um, which you can see right here at this area. I actually bring my pointer up. Um, here, a uh, photo was taken. Um, also, when it was taken as well, so we have that date. Um, and then the app, if you press this, what did you see? The app, the first level of, of getting an identification is that iNaturalist has um, computer vision, or a lot of people call it artificial intelligence, where it's gonna take that photo and use its intelligence to try to actually give you a suggestion on what it thinks you just took a photo of. Um, so you can see in this case, it's saying it's pretty sure it's in this genus, and then it's giving you some species suggestions for what it is. Um, and what it's also telling you is that this one, we, the reason we're suggesting this one is that it's visually similar and it's been seen nearby. Um, and often, depending on where you are in the world, um, luckily in California, it works really well, often that first suggestion uh, tends to be the right one, as long as your photo is a pretty clear photo and it's not confusing um, the AI. So you can pick 
uh, a suggestion. If you know what the species is, you can go ahead and type it in. If you're like, none of these suggestions look right at all, I'm just going to say that this is a plant. That's a, a taxonomy in there. Um, and then you share it um, with the iNaturalist community. Um, so here's that exact same photo now on looking at it on the website. Every observation you make has its own page on the website. Um, and so you can see again, here's the photo. It's showing us where it was seen, um, when it was seen, who made that observation. And in this case, you can see that other people on the platform have chimed in and agreed with that identification. So once it's uploaded to iNaturalist, that's where kind of like the power of the community um, on iNaturalist comes in is that they can look at those identifications and they can say like, yes, that looks totally right. Or no, actually that's the wrong species and they'll put the right one in. Um, or if, I, if someone had entered this just as a plant, they could have actually helped get it down to species as well. Every observation on iNaturalist also has this data quality assessment um, where it's asking basically, you know, does the location seem right? Does the date seem right? Uh, you know, is the organism wild? Things like that. Um, and then once uh, at least two thirds of the people who've added an ID agree what species it is, um, an observation becomes what we call a research grade observation. So you can see it right here, it's telling us this, the quality grade of this observation is research because it meets all these data quality assessment community ID that, it, that at least two thirds of the people who've added an ID agree what species it is. So this is now a research grade observation. It's a species occurrence record. Um, and so that's really where the power of iNaturalist lies, like I said, is in the community. Um, the artificial intelligence in iNaturalist in the app is wonderful and it's amazing and it works, um, like I said, kind of really, really well in lots of places. Luckily, California is one of those places that tends to work really well. Works less well in places where there have not been as many observations made because it's built on the observations of other people. Um, but the power of iNaturalist really comes in the community. So anyone who's who um, makes observations can also help with identif identifying those observations. So it's not like there's like a team of scientists sitting there waiting for you to upload your observations. It's actually the whole community is involved or is allowed to be involved in that process as well. Um, because in the same way that you know you might know uh, like a birder who knows all their birds, like they might not be a professional birder, but they have taught themselves every single bird. So iNaturalist is really um, about valuing everybody's expertise. So everyone's allowed to help with identifications as well. Um, to give you kind of a, a more in-depth example of what that can look like, um, here's a butterfly, a photo of a butterfly that I took. Um, I was telling Tiffany and Amy before you all jumped on that I go camping in the Plumas National Forest almost every summer um, up by Antelope Lake. Uh, and so when I took this photo, we now know it's a hedgerow hair streak, but when I first took this photo, I'm a marine biologist by training. So all I could say, as I said, that this is, this is a butterfly or a moth. It's a you know, lepidopter is what I knew about it. Um, and then I uploaded it just like that. You can see that ID has been crossed out though because it's, I've since updated my identification. Um, so the next person who saw this observation or who, who, were able, who was able to add an ID to it, they knew what family this butterfly was in. Um, and then you can also see, you can also tag other people and say, hey, come look at this observation. So this person obviously knew that this iNaturalist user knows their butterflies. And so they said, hey, come look at it. Um, and so more people can jump in. Someone knew the subfamily. Someone came in and it's just like, oh, this is what I'm seeing. It could be this one or this one. Um, he asked a couple other folks to come look at it as well. And then finally, someone came in and said, this is a hedgerow hair streak. And people agreed that it was a hedgerow hair streak. Um, I came in and thanked everybody for calling it, you know, for giving me an ID. Um, and this is now a research grade observation of a hedgerow hair streak. And this is kind of a different example of the community coming together and helping to identify something. Um, sometimes it's that they just come in and agree with the ID that you put in there. Um, and sometimes though, it's more of a conversation where people are talking about what they're looking at and um, it takes a little longer to get that identification in there. Um, but now this is research grade because Everyone agrees what species this is, basically. At least or, or over two thirds of the people agree what species this is. Um, and you can see that there's this note on here on the data quality assessment that this observation is featured on one site, the site called GBIF, um, which stands for the Global Biodiversity Information Facility. So iNaturalist shares research grade observations um, with other databases. So all the observations on iNaturalist are open for anybody to explore, to look at, to download, to answer their questions with. 
Um, you can see here, this is all the observations on iNaturalist um, as of yesterday, I think. Um, there's 38 million observations on iNaturalist from all over the world. Over 1 million people have made those observations. So every time you make an observation, whether you're making it just because you want to know what that thing is, um, you are contributing to this global database of when and where species are occurring around the whole world. And then those research grade observations um, are shared with this other database called GBIF, where, um, like I said, the same information that's in, that's in a museum specimen like this one, this California poppy, this uh, label down here is telling us when it was found and where it was found and who found it. Here's a California poppy that I made an observation of, which again is showing where it was found and when it was found and who saw it. That is the exact same information, the same species occurrence records. It just in one case, your evidence is the actual physical plant. And in my case, the evidence is the photo that I took. And so GBIF, this Global Biodiversity Information Facility, is basically a species observation data sets. So it has a whole bunch of species um, from specimens from museums, like historic records, because I go back hundreds of years. Um, it also has current records from museums, current records, research grade records from iNaturalist. Um, if you've ever used eBird, if you're a birder, eBird records go to GBIF as well. Um, and so scientists use GBIF all the time to answer big questions about where species occur, particularly if they're interested in where species that occurred in the past and where they're occurring now, if they think those might be different, you know, maybe due to habitat loss or change in climate or things like that, you would go to GBIF and you could see where those historic museum specimens were found and also where people are finding them currently, posting them on iNaturalist. Um, and actually, that's one of the main uses of the iNaturalist data set, um, is this big data aspect of iNaturalist. The fact that it's sent to other databases, and there's you know, 40 million observations almost on iNaturalist. Um, last year alone, we know of over 225 papers that used iNaturalist data. Um, and when they published their paper to answer their questions, they downloaded it from GBIF with other data sets. Um, and uh, this is definitely one of the main uses, of, at least in science, of iNaturalist, is, is just kind of the big data side of it, downloading a whole bunch of data and answering your questions about where species are occurring in the world or how their distributions are changing. Um, another really important use of iNaturalist data uh, is on the management side of things. Or immediate use of data um, is when you have really engaged and active land managers or resource managers who are using uh, the iNaturalist observations to help them better manage the, you know, the parcels of land that they work on. Uh, so here's a park down by me. I'm down here in Sonoma County. This is Shiloh Ranch Regional Park. We often see for parks or wildlife areas or uh, these sorts of maps, these vegetation maps. Um, and these vegetation maps are often made using satellite images in places like this to kind of understand like what are the main habitats you have in these parcels of land. What's harder though, what most parks do not have the, the people power for or the money for a scientific team to do is to go in and one, verify these um, vegetation maps and two, to actually understand what are those species in those vegetation areas. You know, what if we think there might be a rare species that occurs in, in a particular habitat? Going in and looking and really assessing what all the species you have in an area is, is a much harder task for a parks department to do. Um, usually, like I said, they don't have the, the people power to do it or the money to pay another team to do it. Um, so that's where another real great use of iNaturalist comes in. So here's that exact same park um, in iNaturalist. Uh, there's never been a big event at this park to document species like a bio blitz, which is usually where people come together and document species all, you know, in one day. Um, this park has never had that. So this is just people going in, hiking in the park, making observations as they go along. You can definitely see where some of the main tra trails in this park see as they hike in this park. And you can see there's been over 1,300 observations made in this particular park. And over 400 species have been documented as well. Um, and so this is a Sonoma County Park, and I know our Sonoma County Parks um, managers here actually do watch iNaturalist to see what people are recording. You can see iNaturalist is, um, displays their species from the most observed, so this hill, hillside uh, woodland star is the most observed um, uh, species in this um, park, and then from there it kind of goes on to the least observed, to things that have only been observed once. But it also tells us what, what things are native, what species are introduced in the area. Um, if any of these were rare or endangered, um, it would put that on this, on the species page as well. 
So a lot of managers use this information to help them better understand what species are in the areas that they manage um, and then to make you know, better decisions based on that information, you know, better uh, management decisions. Um, and then finally, one of the other third, one of the other really cool uses of the data on iNaturalist is the fact that when you have, right now it's over a million people that are making observations on iNaturalist. When you have that many people out and looking and seeing what they can find, you're bound to find things that you were not expecting. You know, just when you're out there looking, you're eventually gonna see, see something that you just didn't know was there. Um, and so this is a fish that washed up uh, down near Santa Barbara uh, last year. Um, and if you live on the coast or if you know coastal species, most of us would assume this is a mola mola um, or a common mola or an ocean sunfish is another name for it. Um, they're pretty common off of our coast and they do definitely wash up on the coast um, relatively often as well. Um, so this person found it. They took a whole bunch of photos. Here's a photo of their son um, with, this, with this mola and they uploaded it to iNaturalist. And you can see when they first uploaded it, they put this species down as a common mola, a mola mola, which is the, definitely the species that we would assume it was here off the California coast. Um, you can see that's crossed out there, that people have uh, since changed their, uh, changed their ID. Um, and interestingly enough, someone came in and said, actually, I'm only going to put it to genus. I don't think we can say what species it is, because I think it might be a different species. Um, and so they started asking other people to come look at it. Um, and so on iNaturalist, like I said, we have a bunch of, there's a bunch of amateur naturalists on there, but there are a bunch of experts on iNaturalist as well. Uh, this person who chimed in and started talk, looking at this observation is the collection manager of ichthyology at the South Australian Museum. Um, he pinged, he said, I think it might be this, this other species called the hoodwinker mola. And he actually pinged this woman who uh, is a doctoral student who described this particular species that he thinks it might be. She discovered and described this species. Um, and so this conversation happened. People were like, oh, if there was only more photos. And so the person who found it went out and took more photos. Um, this whole conversation was going on about what they were looking at and trying to figure out what species this could be. And so a comment. Uh, where they realized that it was this hoodwinker mola, the species that they were not expecting to find on the California coast. And the reason that they were so excited about this hoodwinker mola, so now here's the observation, research grade observation of this hoodwinker mola. The reason they were so excited is that if we go to GBIF and we see where this species has been found in the past, it had only ever been observed in the Southern Hemisphere. And so this observation that someone you know, made and put on iNaturalist was the first time it had ever been found in the Northern Hemisphere, which is pretty amazing, which is why people were so excited and thought it was such an interesting find. Um, and the interesting thing is that actually since then, people have actually made, found live, uh, live hoodwinker molas swimming in Monterey Bay too, which is pretty cool. So now people are on the lookout for them and trying to understand you know, how long have they been here? Are they breeding off our coast now? Uh, it's a really interesting discovery that has now led to more questions that people are trying to answer um, using iNaturalist observation. Um, so I've talked a lot about how you use the app on iNaturalist. I want to talk a little bit about the website too, because a lot of people only ever make observations and they never go to the website. Next school is so much richer and you can find out so much more cool information if you actually go visit the website itself. So here's what it looks like when I log in. This is my dashboard um, where it shows me people. You can follow people, you can follow places, you can follow species, you kind of get that information in your dashboard. Um, but the really fun part of iNaturalist comes when you start exploring the observations. Um, so here's all the observations in California. There's almost 5 million observations that have been made in California alone, which is pretty amazing because that's over 10% of all the observations that have been made on iNaturalist ever around the whole world. So we got lots of active folks um, using iNaturalist in California itself. And every single one of those points represents an observation that you can go and look at and see what someone found. So I just wanted to highlight some of the cool things people have seen lately in California. Um, so this is just over the last month or so, just going and randomly looking at observations. Um, here's this cool fox squirrel. Uh, there was a huge heat wave down in Southern California when this person took this photo and you can see it reflected in how this fox squirrel is feeling about the weather that down nudibranch that someone made an observation of along the coast down um, near Santa Barbara. Here's this cool um, bug that hasn't actually been ID'd down to species yet that matches this flower it's on absolutely perfectly. Uh, here's desert bighorn sheep taking advantage of a completely empty parking lot down at Anza Borrega State Park um, due to the fact that it's closed right now because of the pandemic. 
uh, here's these awesome sugar stick, these parasitic plants that were observed um, up in Shasta County recently. And this super cute little oak tree hopper um, and made in the foothills of the Sierra uh, near Tahoe. Uh, just in the last few days, I think this observation was made. And finally, I wanted to end with this one. If you've heard about the bioluminescence that's been happening down in Southern California, um, we know what species causes this bioluminescence. So someone actually took uh, the series of photos and turned it into a GIF and posted it to iNaturalist. Um, and we were able to ID what species it is. So this observation is now a research grade observation of the diatom that makes this bioluminescence, which is pretty cool. Uh, so it's really fun to go in and explore and just look and see what people are seeing um, you know, um, on iNaturalist. I do wanna say really quickly though, that um, you know, if you're really interested in going out and making observations around your house or in your backyard right now, um, depending on, you know, I was talking before, uh, here in Sonoma, a lot of our parks are still closed, especially along the coast. And so if you're thinking about making observations around your house, I did wanna point out a couple things um, in the app. Um, and that's these two points right here. Um, the bottom one, this question, this is the Android version of the app and the iPhone version of the app. And you can see one of the things that they have here is, is this a captive or cultivated organism? Um, is this a captive or cultivated organism? So if you decide to take a photo, make an observation of a plant that you planted, like flowers that you have in your garden or something like that, that's one thing that you should definitely do in the app is just check that this is not a wild organism. That's really important for that data sharing aspect. You can imagine we don't want people going to the zoo and saying like, oh, here's a, you know, a giraffe in San Francisco um, because that's a captive organism. We don't want to share that information you know, with like scientists answering questions about where giraffes exist in the world. Um, also, this other point right here is location visibility. So the default is open location visibility that you know, wherever you saw that species, other people can see that point too. Um, there are some things that are automatically obscured in iNaturalist, like species that are rare or um, could be uh, in danger of poaching if someone po posted the actual point. But you also have the ability to obscure any observation that you make too. So if you're interested in going and using this in your backyard, but you don't want to have a cluster of observations showing everybody where you live, um, I recommend using this obscured visibility, which obscures it kind of in a 22 kilometer box. So it's a pretty far, it's close enough that it could still be used for science to answer questions about where species occur, but far enough that people are not going to be able to see where your house is. Um, I just recommend not making an observation private unless you have a really good reason why no one should be able to see that um, observation because those observations without any location information at all just are not very useful for science because um, basically it's going to say this was seen somewhere in the entire world. Um, but you, you do, do have the ability to obscure any observation that you personally make. So zooming in on Lassen County, you can also um, explore things closer to your home. Um, so there's been over 4,000 observations made in Lassen County itself. All the counties in California are places people can also, um, There's over 1,200 species that have been observed in Lassen County. And I have to say, you guys have some of the coolest, like most observed species. The fact that you guys have pronghorns and deer and black bears and like coyotes in your top 10 is awesome. Like most, most counties have like California poppies and fence lizards and, you know, in, introduced species and stuff like that. So uh, it's pretty cool that those are your, in some of your top 10 most observed species in Lassen County. Um, you can also see who's making those observations. So here's your 15 top observers in Lassen County. Um, maybe you recognize some of those folks. I actually recognize this person because he works in San Francisco. Um, <laughs> so people obviously who are visiting Lassen County and making observations as well. You can also look at particular um, taxa. So these are the 100, or not, it's not all 120, but there have been 121 species of butterflies and moths observed in Lassen County that you can go and look at. These are the, the beautiful iconic species photos, but you can go and explore and see where people are finding them and what species of, of butterflies people are finding. You can look at the plants that people are finding in Lassen County. So you can filter, you know, once you get in and start exploring the data, you can filter it in all sorts of ways, you know, by place, by taxa, by place and taxon. Um, so these are, you know, there's been over 500 species of plants observed in Lassen County, and you can go and see what, what plants people are finding in the area as well. Um, I particularly love Calico calicordus lilies. You've got two of them down here that are actually um, some of your most observed species. Mariposa lilies. So what Mariposa lilies people are finding in Lassen County and where people are finding them. So there's been three 
uh, different species of, of Calicoris mariposa lily observed in, in Lassen County. You can actually go and see, like, um, if you wanted to say, you know, if you're like, I want to go see them myself, you can actually go and see where people have made those observations and you can go and see them in person, um, which is pretty amazing as well. And every species has its own species page on iNaturalist. So if you're really interested, like, you know, I want to learn more about this sagebrush mariposa lily. It's beautiful. I want to see more about it. Every species has its own species page in iNaturalist um, that'll show you, um, you know, how many, the last observation that was made of it, how many total observations there are of it um, on iNaturalist, um, you know, who's the top observer, who's the top identifier. It shows you seasonality, which is actually really nice to see because you can imagine most people probably take photos of this flowering plant when it's flowering. So that gives you a good idea of when you're most likely to see it. I would say probably July um, is your most likely time to find this plant. Um, you can also see other photos of it. So you can go and explore all the photos that have been taken of this one particular species on iNaturalist. You can see it definitely has some interesting variation. And you can see on the map where are people finding it. Um, and you can also see, uh, so these are all the observations on iNaturalist, but if you wanted to, you could also say, hey, show me where observations of this on GBIF. Like, where are their museum specimens of this? You could check that and put that on the map also. Um, and you can also learn more, all, almost all the pages link to a Wikipedia page if it has it, so you can learn more about it there. You also have lots of other options to learn more about this particular species too. So every species has a page like this on iNaturalist that you could really dive in and learn a ton about one particular species. The great thing about iNaturalist too is that it's like your own personal field journal. So um, it also keeps track of every observation you personally have made. So you can see I'm here under your observations. Uh, so I personally have made over 15,000 observations on iNaturalist. It's because I've been using it for a really long time and I use it for work. Um, and so I can go and I can see all the places where I've been able to go and make iNaturalist observations, including down in the Galapagos and over in England. Every place I go, I try to make at least one observation if I can, usually multiple. I can also look at all the species I've ever seen. So I've observed um, about 2,800 2, species on iNaturalist. Uh, because I'm a marine biologist, my top species are all marine species, but I can go and explore, and, and this keeps track for me of every species I've ever made an observation of and posted on iNaturalist, which is awesome. In the same way that birders love to keep the life list, this is like a, my, my life list of all the species I've ever seen, which is pretty awesome. I can also, again, filter and say, like, I just want to know what butterfly and moth species I've seen. So I've seen 95 different species of butterflies and moths, so I can always go in and check and see see it's a new species for me which is always fun to see or how many other times I've observed that one particular species um, and also observations on iNaturalist like I said while you might be making them just because you want to learn what it is and you want to contribute to this big um, data set um, there's also projects on iNaturalist where people are asking um, for particular observations to help answer their questions as well so you can see this butterfly that I actually saw in my backyard this gray hair streak got added to two other projects. It got added to this eButterfly North America project and also po uh, Backyard Pollinators of the Bay Area project as well. So people um, constantly use projects to help them kind of pull observations together and help them answer the questions that they have about where species are occurring or it, what particular species are found in particular places, uh, things like that. So I went and looked um, at projects uh, around your area in Lassen um, there's this Eagle Lake watershed project um, that someone has made um, up near uh, up near you guys. You can see that um, they've obviously drawn their own place, this watershed um, of Eagle Lake. Uh, that they've told iNaturalist is that they said, here's my place, pull in all the observations that are made in this one place so I can keep track of the species found in the Eagle Lake watershed. So the cool thing about projects is that it shows you the same information that you could look at in, in the Explore tab. Like I could go look at this place in, in that Explore tab and see all the observations that are made there, but projects also tell you some other interesting information too. So it also tells us who's making the most observations in this place, who's found the most species, um, what are the most observed species in this one particular place as well. That's all within a project in iNaturalist. Um, Projects also give you interesting statistics also. So you can go in and you can see, you know, how many of the observations in the project have made it to research grade and how many still need to be identified. Um, what are, what's the breakdown of species? You can see like 33% of the, of, of the species in this project are plants. 
Most of the species or a larger portion of the species in the project are insects. Um, the types of identifications that are being made on that on the project as well. Um, so your observations might get automatically pulled into a project um, if it meets the criteria and someone might use that information to help them answer their questions. I also want to say point out really quickly, like I said, is that everybody, anyone can make observations and anyone can also help with ident identifying things on iNaturalist also. So um, you can see there's this identify tool if you're in the website. If you click that, it's going to show you all the observations on iNaturalist that have not made it to research grade yet. Um, for me, it defaults to all the observations in California because I've told iNaturalist that California is my place. Um, and so it's showing me all the observations that still need identification. Um, you can see that it makes it really easy to look at lots of observations at once that I can go in and I can agree with the species that's already there. But things that are still only at genus level, for example, I species, um, or I can you know, just skip it and say, like, that's not something I know. I'm just going to go on to the next one. You can also um, filter it even more. So here's all the plants in Lassen County that still need identifications. Um, so if you are someone who knows your plants or at least knows some part of your plants, um, you know, some group of plants, you could go through all the observations in Lassen County that still need help with identifications. You can agree with the species that are already there or you can add a different species if you don't agree with it. Um, or you can take something that's still at genus level and try to help it get it down to species or maybe things that are still at family level. Most of these, these are genus, it looks like. Um, but yeah, if something's even, or here's one that's a family, this one up here. You could help try to get it down to genus or even down to species itself. Um, or how to get things down to species. Um, you can also go and look for things. So here's Lassen County again. Um, and in the filters button right here, you can pick the unknowns. It's basically a question mark, things that have no ID at all on them. Someone uploaded it without any identification at all. And if you can go through and you can say, this is a plant, like I know this is a plant, this is a plant, this is a plant. And if you can even put a really high level ID on an unknown, that means the people who do know their plants of Lassen County can find this observation much easier and help put an ID on it. So even if you feel like you know nothing, as long as you can say that this is a plant or like this is a bird or like I know this is a reptile, that's super helpful to go through the unknowns and help put identifications on those things. So people who do know those groups can then find them and get them down to species. Finally, I just wanna add one other thing. Um, a lot of folks right now, as, as people are still sheltering in place in, in some amount, um, have a lot of time to maybe go and upload your old photos of nature. Um, it doesn't have to be current things that you're making observations of on iNaturalist. iNaturalist has this upload button on the website and you can literally drag and drop a bunch of old photos of nature that you have. Um, and it doesn't matter where you saw it. Hopefully the photo probably has at least the information about when you saw it because it probably was on your camera when you took it but maybe your camera doesn't have a GPS and that's fine what you can do is you can go in and you can actually on a map drop a pin and say this is where I saw this thing and if you're not exactly sure you can change this accuracy bubble if you're like I know I was in this park so I'm gonna drop the pin in the middle of the park and make the accuracy bubble the whole park that's totally fine at least you're telling us I didn't see it exactly here but I saw it somewhere in this area so you can go and upload your old photos. And the cool thing is, is that artificial intelligence that I was telling you about that's in the app is also on the website. So as you're going through on this page, if you click the species name, it's gonna give you again suggestions. It's telling us, I'm pretty sure it's in this genus and here's our top 10 species suggestions. And again, I'm looking for things that say they're visually similar and seen nearby as good choices. And then once you've gone through and added locations and species to all of these, you, or like, like I said, or you could just say like, this is a butterfly. Like I don't actually agree with any of them. Then you can just upload, you can submit them and now they're up on iNaturalist. And there's really cool, there's records, you know, people have definitely taken the time and, you know, uploaded their photos from the 1970s are on iNaturalist now. Um, really cool, you know, really, um, you know, from decades ago, observations are up there just because someone has saved those photos um, and they've decided to take the time to put them on iNaturalist and they knew, at least had a general idea of where they were when they saw them. Um, which is pretty cool. So hopefully um, this talk has inspired you to get out and explore, um, but then share what you find um, because you might be making that photo, you know, taking that photo just because you want to maybe learn more about that species or try to figure out what that species is. But that observation you make 
could definitely be used to answer scientific questions or to help a land manager better understand the area that you took that photo in. Or maybe it's a totally surprising new thing that we didn't know was there, like that, that um, Hoodwinker Mola. You never know when you take a photo, uh, but when you share it, you can find out more information about it. Um, so with that, I'll say thank you. Um, here's the website of our citizen science um, uh, at the academy, and iNaturalist.org is the website there. Um, or if you want to reach out to me on Twitter, or if you want to look at my observations on iNaturalist, that's me. I'm Kestrel on iNaturalist. You can go in and see all my marine species that I take photos of. <laughs> Um, so thank you guys. Yeah, thanks, Allison. That's so excited. So <laughs> well, it was cool to see uh, Lassen County, and yeah, there was a few of mine up there. Nice. <laughs> so I was like, oh, I need to go back and put IDs on those. Um, so we'll take if you. I don't know if anyone has any quick questions um, for Allison while we we have her here. Um, we can open it up to, to any questions. Clearly, I just explained everything so well. <laughs> it's fine. I know. You know, I actually had a couple questions and now I've forgotten them. So I'm probably just going to email you later. They came up and then I just got confused or not confused but just excited about everything so um but yeah so uh we have started a project for this weekend for memorial day weekend so if you um if you sign up for an account on inaturalist.org um, uh you can search uh under projects for life and land and trails trust and um, so it's for May 23rd through May 25th. And um, if you join this project, then any observations you make this weekend will go on that project. And we have some prizes um, for, let's see if I can remember, what are our categories? Um, most insect observations, uh, most diversity of observations, and then also most unique which the most unique will be a little subjective. Um, it'll be determined by the Land Trust Outreach Committee. Um, it'll be kind of fun to see what people come up with. Um, and so, yeah, so we're hoping you all can join and others in the area that are on iNaturalist and um, we'll see what everybody finds over the holiday weekend. And it doesn't necessarily have to be in, in Lassen County. I know some people might be camping other places or something, so. Um, but yeah, we just like to see what everyone finds and give them an excuse to go go out there. Um, and I guess, I don't know if there's anything else. Uh, one other thing is um, uh, in, I think it's two weeks on June 4th, we're gonna be doing another uh, Zoom meeting for our, or what we're promoting as a puncture vine pole. So puncture vine is this horrible weed that pops your, um, bike tires, or at least my bike tires, and uh, it's in your dog's paw and everything like that. And we'd really like to get people out pulling it. And June, well, late May, early June is about the time um, that it starts coming out. So Tom Getz from Cooperative Extension is going to do a quick little Zoom info on puncture vine and pulling it. So um, please join us in two weeks for that. Um, and with that, I guess this. And no one has any other questions. Um, thanks again, Allison. That was really wonderful. And it was so cool to see Lassen County too. That was fun. So, I always try to personalize my um, talks to wherever I'm, I'm giving, giving it. So. That was so cool. Yeah, and we also recorded this. So we'll sure all of you know people that would love to hear this. So um, we'll be able to, well, I guess we can post that somewhere that people will be able to watch it again later. So yeah, thanks everyone for coming and have a good rest of your night. Awesome. Thanks everybody. Thanks, bye. <laughs> thanks bye. bye. Yeah, thanks for inviting me. Yeah, uh, <laughs> super fun. Um, can you send us your address? Yeah. So we can send you a little thank you. Okay. Sure. Awesome. Happy to do it. Okay. Awesome. All right. <laughs> thanks guys. Thanks.